Paul, thanks for joining us. We are discussing now the case of the uh, Ukrainian National Guard soldier Vitaly Markiv and in particular the accusation of him uh, of murder of the Italian journalist and the Russian uh, translator uh, in Slavyansk. Uh, but what we know from this story is that uh, the, the court case that the uh, testimony of the witness uh, of the um, of, of the prosecutor was mainly based off the talks of the local Italian freelancers and in particular French journalist William Ragillon. Uh, you've been working in uh, Slavyansk as well in uh, early uh, in spring, uh, May 2014. Can you describe what were the conditions of the journalists there in particular around the time that this tragedy had happened? Uh, yes. First, uh, I think uh, we have to understand that we were a lot of freelancers, like uh, I was, like William Rockland was, like freelancers that decided to come in uh, Donbass to 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 try to begin to work to send uh, offer pictures, offer stories, and uh, most of these freelancers were living in a hostel uh, that was located in Center Donetsk. And uh, William was one of them. I lived with William uh, for three or four days in uh, Donetsk. Uh, he came to uh, live with us. And we, uh, from the beginning, we understood that uh, it was kind of first experience. He already worked in Syria before, but uh, he, he was like a lot of freelancers, like a bit lost. Uh, he couldn't understand what was happening. Uh, he even asked us something like, who are the bad, who are the good? So we had to explain him uh, who were uh, the separatists, uh, where was the Ukrainian army? And we had to explain him what was happening in Slavyansk. And uh, you have to know that at this time, we all understood that in Slavyansk, uh, the shelling were terrible, the war was uh, going on. And we all decided to stay in Donetsk just for security reasons, because we were freelancers. We had no money to organize this kind of uh, report uh, inside the shelling. And in some ways, it was totally useless to go under the shelling. So um, to tell you all the story, uh, the morning this catastrophe happened, uh, William asked us, if we wanted to go with the, him, with them, uh, in Slavyansk, because uh, he worked for three or four days in uh, Donetsk, he told us he was bored by that, because uh, uh, the war was concentrated in uh, Slavyansk. And, uh, and so he decided to go there. Uh, he asked us if we wanted to go with him, and we said, no, it's too dangerous. Uh, I remember his last word to me were uh, something like, I'm going to call you uh, if I need help or if something happened. I told him, I don't really know you, call me if you want. Uh, and then the day happened and uh, William called me during the day and he was totally in panic. The shelling was going on. He told me they are all dead. I don't know if they are dead. Uh, I don't know if the Italian guy is dead. I couldn't save him. I've tried to calm him. I've asked him, tell me where you are, who were the guys with you, uh, what is happening now, uh, do you have a solution to, to leave the place? Uh, he was totally in panic. I just understood that he was with a Russian man and an Italian man. Uh, he, he didn't tell me about Ukraine or separatist shelling. He just didn't know what happened uh, because he didn't know where uh, he was. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I called the embassy, uh, Italian and French embassy, to tell them that something was happening. And then uh, he came to hospital and we learned then that the Italian photographer uh, dead, died. So, Paul, uh, the case uh, of uh, Ukrainian soldier Vitaly Markiv is based on the um, idea, this accusation, that that was a deliberate murder, that it was not a collateral damage which happens during the time of the crossfire. Uh, we remember that uh, time. Not everybody remembers, but I also remember how it was there at the area. Uh, but that was 
done in particular by a particular man in order to kill the witnesses, the journalists who were showing something. Uh, to what extent, I understand it's quite theoretic, but just knowing so, so well what was going on there in Slavyansk, meaning like this shelling, uh, how can you also describe the nature of, uh, of the events and of the shelling? To what extent you can, uh, we can consider about any kind of a deliberate murder of journalists? Uh, actually, when I saw uh, what the Italian tribunal said, I was a bit surprised because uh, we all remember that at this time the shelling were strong, uh, the fights were really strong, and uh, we couldn't even imagine to go there to inside this shelling to see wh what happened. And I even think uh, Ukrainian army and the separatist side, uh, I think we don't. It was such a mess at this time that the position were moving. Uh, during the day, and uh, I think sometimes even Ukrainian army or separatist soldiers, they did not really knew where they, where was the front line because there were no front line at this time actually, and, and so it was a really big mess, and I was really surprised to see what the Ital Italian uh, justice said because uh, I can't imagine that someone decided to kill like this journalist, like that, because I remember at this time when I was in Ukrainian side or in the separatist side, the priority for Ukrainian and separatist was to protect the journalist because they didn't want to kill a journalist because we knew after they would have a lot of government, a lot of pressure, a lot of problems uh, trying to, to call them and to control them. So everyone was really careful with journalists. The things that I, I don't know about this Italian photographer, but I, I know William came there without knowing where he was going. And I remember they had a car, like an old car, uh, where nothing was written. They were not uh, identified like journalists. And uh, you just go with this car in the middle of the fights. And at this time, you know, the separatists were traveling in cars and uh, trucks in the middle of Slavyansk. Uh, like uh, it was not written separatists or, or fighters on their car. So Ukrainian army was fighting against them. And I guess they just couldn't know who was in this car. And uh, I, I don't really understand if there is a, a sense to try to understand uh, if uh, it was normal or not that the Ukrainian army dis decided to shell at this time or not, because it was just really big mess and everyone was fighting at this time. And uh, Paul, what we also understand that there was no, uh, from the Italian side, any kind of uh, idea of the independent investigations and uh, there were some suggestions. So the, do you know anything about like the people like you who were there on the side, who were witnesses of the, uh, uh, the way the journalists were working in Slavyansk exactly during the day? Were they ever uh, questions? Were you ever approached by the Italian investigations uh, to give any kind of evidence to make the case more clear? Uh, no, um, actually I was maybe a bit surprised because I, I don't know at all about the Italian. I never met this photographer. I don't know if he made mistakes or not, but I know that he's French and I also know all the French embassy uh, organized uh, is a kind of escape from Donbass after I follow everything. And uh, I know this French came back to France and came to police to ask them to investigate. And at this time, back at this time, French police called some of my colleagues that participated uh, to, uh, to the, the escape from Donbass. Uh, but I also remember police, French police told them that uh, they were not expecting to make a real investigation because it was a war zone and they just couldn't uh, find someone guilty into a war zone. Uh, but that's all what I know. But from Italian side, uh, none of my colleagues have been uh, called or, yes, being asking questions on this topic.
So, Paul, thanks a lot for talking to us. Uh, we hope that this information would uh, also uh, be publicized and would be picked up because we are staying on the case. Thank you. Thank you.